Welcome to the Real Lost Boss podcast. Hello, welcome to episode 19 of the Real Lost Boss podcast. And this episode's topic is lifestyle changes that led to my weight loss success. Yes, things that I implemented at the beginning of my weight loss journey that are still present now. It is currently January 2024. And on the 3rd of February, February, 2024, is my 10-year uh, anniversary of me starting my weight loss journey. And everything I'm going to discuss in this episode, yeah, are things that I put in from the beginning. And at the beginning of my journey, I didn't actually realise the benefits of what I was doing or the value of what I was doing. But those things that I did put in, or these things that I'm going to discuss, are still present now. And they are what I would call support tools that have led me to not only lose weight, hit my goal weight, and then maintain that loss for over six years now and counting. When I started my weight loss journey in 2014, <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing, if I'm being totally honest. I didn't, I didn't. But I set one precedent. I said to myself, I want to lose weight in a way that I've never, ever tried before. Because I was desperate for success. All the previous methods that I tried, I failed at, like many of us do now, where, you know, we're jumping on fad diets like Slimming World, Slim Fast Shakes, intermittent fasting, not eating carbs, eating stupidly low amounts of calories, all these crazy, in all honesty, ways to lose weight, they just don't lead to long-term success. And yeah, I just wanted to do it in a totally different way. So when I'd made the decision to start this weight loss journey, which was Christmas 2013, um, I did dry January in 2014. Now, I'm currently doing dry January and it doesn't seem like a big deal nowadays. But in 2014, I was a big, big drinker. And I was just talking about uh, my current size at the time. You know, I did. I drank a lot of alcohol. So I did dry January 2014. And I kind of did that to try and prove to myself that things that I felt I was dependent on, I could stop. Right, I was obviously very dependent on food because I was 37 stone, but you know, I thought I'll do dry January. And while I was doing dry January, I obviously became a little bit of a hermit because I used to spend four or five nights a week in the pub and I really cut that down. I still went out, I still went and played pool for my local pool team. Uh, but Friday, Saturday nights, I might have nipped into the pub for I don't know half an hour, 45 minutes to say hello to a few mates, had a Coke or two and uh, and disappeared. Um, so I had a lot more free time on my hands. And, you know, free time? Yeah, free time on my hands. Uh, and I utilised this free time to really think and plan about how I was going to do this weight loss journey. And like I say, you know, one thing I was really mindful of was not doing anything that I'd done in the past. I wanted to do things totally, totally different. So the first change that I made um, was looking at calories. I remember being dragged to a dietitian in the late 80s. Um, my primary school sort of raised concerns about my obesity. I was then um, took to uh, my local GP practice by my mum because she wanted to discuss it with them. They then then referred me to a dietitian, and both my GP and the dietitian told me that I needed to go onto a calorie controlled diet. But they never told me how to go onto a calorie controlled diet. They told me a method to reduce my calories, but they never discussed calories with me. They never sort of explained what a calorie controlled diet was. They literally, maybe not the GP, but certainly the dietitian, just got this list, this piece of paper, and they basically said, on this side, these are the foods that Neil should be eating, and on this side, these are the foods that Neil shouldn't be eating. So yes, that is obviously controlling calories, because the side 
that said this is what Neil shouldn't be eating was calorie dense, you know, highly palatable foods. Uh, and the side that Neil should be eating was obviously a lot more low calorie, much healthier uh, food. So, of course, that is controlling calories. But they never explained about calories in, calories out, you know, sticking to a set amount of calories. Now, I don't, in a way, I suppose that was a good thing. In another way, it was a bad thing. And, you know, I don't think calorie counting or discussing calories should be um, introduced to children that uh, have a weight issue. I just don't think there's there's any need to do that. Um, and I'm going to do a podcast in the future on, on childhood obesity and how to tackle weight loss, especially if you're watching this now and you do have children that have a weight issue. Um, I'm going to go into more detail about how I tackle um, obesity with children. And you don't need to go down the calorie counting route. But even if they took me to one side or asked me to sit outside and discussed it with my mum and said to my mum, look, basically, Neil burns this many calories. He needs to be eating this many calories. Uh, you don't need to talk about calories with him, but you're his legal guardian. You're his parent. You're the person that um, makes his food, does the food shopping. You're his responsibility. And this is, you know, what you need to do. And his breakfast needs to be this many calories and his lunch needs to be this and his tea needs to be that. Again, you don't need to discuss that with him uh, directly. But when you dish up his tea, make sure it's six, seven hundred calories. When you um, send him to, to school with a pat lunch, that pat lunch should be, again, maybe five, six hundred calories. There was none of that. So I just decided to look at calories. Um... And you know what? It was one of the best things I did because it just, it kind of flicked on a light switch. A light bulb just went off. I was like, ah, I get it. So I burn this many calories because that's all the calories. It's just uh, a reference of energy. Calories are how we determine energy going into the body, food and drink, and energy coming out of the body through our metabolism, daily movement and exercise. And when we compare the two, that is the only thing that affects our body fat. If we consume, obviously, less calories than we burn, so we take out more energy than we put in, that reduces our stored energy, which is what body fat is. And I love that premise. I, I just like, I know it. I'm not shooting in the dark all the time. I know that, you know, I at the time, I didn't know how many calories I burned, I'll be honest with you, uh, but... I knew I probably burnt a lot of calories because of my size. And therefore, I just decided to eat the recommended average calories for a male, which was 2,500 at the time. So I was like, right, that is how I'm going to control my calories. An average male eats 2,500 calories a day. I am not the average male because I'm 37 stone, six foot five inches tall. Um, so if I eat the calories of an, of an average male, obviously I'm going to be consuming less energy than than I put in. That was kind of, you know, the basis around it. Again, at the time, I didn't realise that I was putting myself into this calorie deficit. I didn't realise I was putting myself into a large calorie deficit because I did burn a lot of calories at 37 stone. But, yeah, it was the first time ever losing weight I looked at calories. And I still do that 10 years on. Um, I track my calories every single day. Now, at the time, I didn't track my calories. I didn't have a clue what my fitness pal or NutriCheck was. I don't know if NutriCheck was around at that time. I don't even know if my fitness pal was. I didn't start using my fitness pal till two years into my weight loss journey. Uh, basically, what I did was I, I did uh, I had a calorie structure, which is what I give to my online clients now. And I had a set amount of calories for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, or as I like to call it, breakfast, dinner, and tea. And then I had an extra little pot for snacks or what I call extras. So that little pot for snacks and extras was basically um, if I um, wanted more than 700 calories for my tea, I'd take it out of that extras pot. Likewise, if I was going to have a snack in the afternoon or a snack in the evening, it would come out of the snack stroke extras pot. Um, and it just works. It, it, it does. It just works. It's a great way to control your eating. Um, and now it's even easier because I do. I track my calories every day. Do I need to track my calories every day? Absolutely not. I've done this for so long now. I can subconsciously 
give myself the right types of food, the right portion size. You know, if I know I'm going to have 600 calories for my lunch, I don't need to track those calories. I can just make a meal for 600 calories. And it, you know, I've, I've got that control. And you'll have exactly the same as that. If you are consistent in tracking your calories for as long as I've done it for, you'll just learn. You'll learn along the way of the types of food you should be mostly eating, the portion size you should mostly be having. So why do I track my calories every day still? Uh, a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, I don't find it a chore. I find it really, really easy. So why would I not do something that I find easy that keeps me in control of my eating? Uh, and number two, I never ever want to be a hypocritical coach, stroke influencer, however, you know, if you work with me on a one-to-one -one basis or you're in my community, you might class me as your weight loss coach. If you just follow me on social media or you're just watching my uh, podcast, then you might just class me as an influencer. But I never want to be a hypocrite. Everything I tell you guys to do, I do. So no one can ever turn around to me and go, well, it's all right for you. You don't need to do this anymore because you've lost your weight. I do it. Whatever I tell you to do, I do as well. So I started off my weight loss journey looking at calories. I still look at calories now. And I used to stick to 2,500 calories a day. The next thing that I implemented into my lifestyle was treat nights. So again, previous methods of me losing weight had always left me feeling overly restricted from slim fast shakes to having a certain amount of sins every day uh, to just boycotting certain foods, saying I'm never eating a takeaway again, I'm never eating chocolate again, I'm never eating crisps again. Whatever method I had tried in the past from that dietitian giving my mum this list that we pinned on the fridge, Neil can't eat this, Neil can eat that. There was no balance there. There was not, Neil should eat this list most of the time, this list a little bit at a time. You can have a McDonald's, but maybe once a week or once every two weeks or something like that, balance. None of that. It was eat this, don't eat this. Restriction, over restriction. And again, I didn't want that. I didn't want to feel overly restricted because when I feel overly restricted, I kind of rebel against it. This is when, you know, cravings really kick in and you just you know, feel like you need more than you give in your body. And in this day and age, never ever apologise for enjoying crisps or chocolate or biscuits. It's fine to enjoy it and it's not unhealthy to enjoy it as long as you enjoy it responsibly and it fits in with your calorie allowance. The first couple of weeks of my weight loss journey, I was sticking to 2,500 calories a day and I built in three treat nights, Wednesday night, Friday night, Sunday night. Wednesday night, I had a chippy tea. I used to have a large, lightly battered fish and a large, mushy peas. That was it. Friday night, I went to the pub and I used to have four pints of Coors Light and a bag of pork scratchings. And on a Sunday night, my treat was a Chinese and I used to have a main course and an egg fried rice. That was it. Yeah. As long as I felt like I'd given it my all for a month, the last Wednesday of every month when I had a chippy on a Wednesday night, I'd have a handful of chips. Um, and on a Sunday, when I had a Chinese, I'd have a starter, last Sunday of the month. Other than that, I was pretty rigid. I was pretty, you know, and after my chippy tea and after my Chinese, I'd either have some sort of dessert. So either a bar of chocolate, a few biscuits, or maybe a piece of cheesecake or something like that. Now, for the first two weeks, I built that into my 2,500 calories. So if I, for example, had a large lightly battered fish and a large peas and a chocolate bar, that's going to be around about 1,200 calories. And I build that into my 2,500 calorie allowance, which means I'd have 1,300 calories left for the rest of the day. And I felt a little bit overly restricted with that. I did. So after a couple of weeks, I changed it. I changed it to 2,500 calories every single day. And then my Wednesday night, my Friday night and my Sunday night treats I just ignored the calories of them. I just enjoyed that a little bit extra on top. And it just, again, it just worked. And it stopped me feeling overly restricted. I never craved anything because I knew that on Wednesday night, I was having a bit of a takeaway and some chocolate. Uh, sometimes I mixed it up. Uh, I knew that on a Friday night, 
although my life revolved around a pub and I'd done dry January um, and I knew I was quite dependent on alcohol, again, a lot of my social life was around a pub and I enjoyed going to the pub. I, I enjoy going to the pub now. Again, very mindful of overly restricting. I was kind of like, if you go to the pub on a Friday night, Neil, when I used to go to the pub on a Friday, pre-weight loss journey, I used to finish work on Fridays at like one o'clock. I'd go home, I might play my Xbox for an hour, get have a shower, get changed, and I'd be in the pub for half two, three o'clock most Fridays, and I'd go home half two, three, four in the morning. There was always a lock-in at my local pub, so I was doing 12-hour sessions every Friday. On my weight loss journey, I cut that down. I used to go to the pub half seven, eight o'clock on a Friday night, and I used to get the last bus home at quarter past ten, so I just went for two hours. So I didn't feel like I was missing out. I was just making this compromise. Rather than going on 12-hour benders on a Friday, I was still going out a couple of hours, having a few pints, seeing my mates, having a good catch-up, having a game of pool, a couple of quid in the jukebox. Great. Just be more responsible. So I had these treat nights on top, and yeah, it just worked. And I still do it now. And I'm a big, you know, I have a lot more flexibility. I was very rigid at the start of my weight loss journey with those treat nights. Now I do it a lot more flexible. Um, and that's how I, co again, I coach my clients. And what I tend to do nowadays, this is just the way I do it. All my clients do it slightly different and depend on where they're at in their journey and what their eating patterns is. But for me now, uh, I tend to bank calories. I track calories and I bank them Monday to Friday. So my current calorie allowance is 2,750 calories a day. Uh, that elicits about, elicit, is that the right word? Anyway, that uh, means I lose about a pound to a pound and a half of body fat a week if I stick to that uh, daily average. So 19,250. And what I do Monday to Friday is I bank some calories between, normally between uh, two and 500 is what I try and bank. And then whatever I bank Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I take into the weekend and I use that for having foods that are higher calorie. Those higher calorie foods tend to be more um, unhealthy than what I normally eat. Um, so for example, you know, I, I'll, I'll stick to my calories and bank Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And then on a Saturday, I might have a Papa John's. I might have a Chinese. We might go out for a meal. Likewise, on a Sunday, might have a nice roast dinner with apple crumble and custard afterwards. Um, might have a great big bacon and egg sandwich. I'm not saying that is unhealthy. I'm not saying that's calorific, but I just give myself a bit more freedom at the weekends rather than having those three set treat nights. And, and likewise, if I need to have a higher calorie Friday, I will do, I'll manipulate my calories around. So I might do a higher calorie Friday, Sunday. I might do Friday, Saturday. I might do Saturday, Sunday. I might, the odd week, for whatever reason, do Thursday, Sunday. It, there's no set rules to it. And I love that flexibility. But however I did it in the past or however I do it now, I have those treat nights. And that leads to feeling less restricted. It reduces cravings. Um, and it's going to make you a lot more consistent on your journey. And that's what we're trying to do. You know, that is what we are trying to do. We are trying to be consistent. There's no point doing something for a month or two months when you need to do it for two years. So whatever you're doing today to lose weight, you need to be prepared to do that for however long it's going to take you to get to your goal weight. For some people, it's six months. For some people, it's 12. For some people, it's three years. And if we're going to try and stick to something for three years, it has to be sustainable. It has to be something we're happy to stick to. Um, and all these things that I'm going to talk about, I know I've only talked about two or three so far, but for the rest of the podcast, all these things that I've implemented into my lifestyle is what's allowed me to be consistent and not only lose weight, hit my goal, and now maintain it. Next, going for a daily walk. I put a lot of emphasis on steps when it comes to a weight loss journey. Why? Why do I put a lot of emphasis on steps? Because the more calories we burn on a day-to-day -day basis, the more calories we can consume and still be in a calorie deficit. And it's a lot easier to stick to... 2,000 calories a day than it is 1,500. It's a lot easier to stick to 2,500 calories a day than it is to stick to 2,000. And your calorie allowance is based, or it should be based, purely off the calories you burn. Now, I'm a big guy, but I move a lot. And because I move a lot, 
and I'm a big guy, I have a high calorie burn, about 3,250 to 3,500 calories a day. Hence why I can eat 2,750 a day on average and consistently lose weight. And what is the best way to increase our calorie burn is to increase our daily movement. It's easy to fit in. You can shuffle it in whether you've got five minutes, 10 minutes, you know, to go to a gym and exercise takes chunks of time out of your day. It might be a 15 minute commute there. You're then going to do an hour in the gym. You're then going to spend 15, 20 minutes getting showered and changed afterwards. And then you've got a 15 minute commute home. That takes time. And that is probably only going to be, you know, suitable two, maybe three times a week at a push because we're busy people and time can be limited. Steps can be built in anywhere. You know, if you've got a 10 minute break at work, go for a walk. Lunch breaks, go for a walk. Get up 20 minutes earlier, go for a walk. You know, when you go to Tesco shopping, park as far away from the entrance as you can. That'll increase your step count. If you go to a shopping center, take the stairs instead of the lift. That increases your step count. If you need a pint of milk from the corner shop and it's a one minute drive or a five minute walk, walk. But one thing I've always implemented is a daily walk. So you can get steps in. You might get your steps in at work. You might work as an A&E nurse or a doctor. You might work doing groundworks. You might be a bin man. You might work behind a bar. Those are all jobs where you're going to do a lot of steps naturally. But whether you do a lot of steps naturally or not, a daily walk is fantastic. Yes, it adds to your step count, but it's also great for your mental health. If that daily walk's half an hour, 45 minutes, it's also great for your physical health. But yeah, daily walks. Now, at the start of my weightless journey, I was 37 stone. I couldn't walk very far. Um, I found it quite tough to walk, but um, why did I find it tough to walk at 37 stone? Yes, obviously being 37 stone played a part in it, but I, I was lazy. And if you don't use it, you lose it. So if you're a sedentary person, if you're quite a lazy person, you spend a lot of time sat down, your legs aren't going to thank you for it. And when you start moving more, they're going to ache. So is your lower back. But as long as you're consistent with moving more, it will improve. I was struggling to walk for five minutes at a time without stopping when I started my weight loss journey. Within three or four months of consistently doing some sort of daily walk, I could walk for 20 minutes without stopping. I was still well over 30 stone, but my body was just adapting to the fact that I was making it do more. And as you make your body do more, it will adapt to it. So if you are currently struggling to do a lot of steps, break those steps up, do little bits at a time, but be consistent with it. And as your body gets used to you moving again, the soreness in your knees, the soreness in your lower back, your hips, your ankles, your feet, it will improve. I promise you that, irrelevant of what weight you are. But yeah, from day one of my weight loss journey, I made the decision to go out for a daily walk and I still do it now. Now, I find it a lot easier nowadays because I have two dogs and those dogs make it very accountable. But I got our first dog, Betty, in July 2017, when I pretty much lost all my weight. So I did this without having the accountability of having dogs, going for my daily walks. 2014, 2015, 2016, six months into 2017, three and a half years, I still went for a daily walk or two, whether I had a dog or not. And it's something I still do now on a day-to-day -day basis. I go out for at least one walk a day. Um, and it's great. It gets steps in. It's great for your physical health. It is great for your mental health. Like I say, it's more great for physical health the longer you do a walk. I don't really class a walk as exercise. That is, again, subjective to what your current fitness levels are, what your current weight is. For me personally, I don't. I just class it as getting steps in unless I go for an hour tread up and down the beach or, you know, we do have a little circuit that we do around my village that's an hour and a half. I might class that as exercise, but generally it's just going for a daily walk. But it's something I did 10 years ago. It's something I still do on a day-to-day -day basis now. Drinking more water. A lot of people think water causes fat loss. It doesn't, or weight loss. Okay, because a lot of people promote hydration and drinking water. Water is just a great support tool and it has a lot of advantages or well, being hydrated has a lot of advantages while on a weight loss journey. 
The two main ones are, if you are fully hydrated, it will suppress your appetite and keep your hunger hormones at bay. Also, if you're fully hydrated, you will have more energy. So if I'm fully hydrated and it suppresses my appetite and keeps my hunger hormones at bay, that's going to make it easier to control calories going in. If you have more energy because you're fully hydrated, you're going to have more motivation to go for that daily walk or to do more steps or even to do some regular exercise, and that's calories out. And if we can put things in all the time into our lifestyle that makes it easier to control calories going in and means we burn more calories going out, that is just a great support tool for your weight loss journey. How do you know you're hydrated? Might sound a bit disgusting, but you need to look at your weight. All right, weed, weed. Um, if you ask someone what color we would be, they'd say it's yellow and it shouldn't be. Your your we should be clear with a slight tint, a slight straw colored tint, right? If that is the color of your we, and yes, you are gonna have to have a look at it, you are hydrated. If your we is yellow in color, if it's orange, go see the doctors, you've probably got a UTI. If it's yellow in color, you're dehydrated. If it's pretty clear with just that slight tinge that is a great indicator that you are hydrated and i just used to drink full fat ribena at 37 stone i used to drink full fat ribena or milk and booze that was about it nowadays i pretty much just predominantly drink water uh, i also have protein shakes and i also have a can of fizzy pop once a day that is zero sugar calorie free um, and that goes on to my next support tool. Fizzy drinks are fantastic. Now, you'll hear a lot of bum for nonsense and rubbish, social media that, you know, artificial sweeteners, they act the same as sugar in the body. No, they don't. There's absolutely no evidence anywhere in the world to suggest that happens. It's all made up jargon and rubbish. You'll also hear that certain uh, artificial sweeteners like aspartame um, is a class 2 carcinogen according to the WHO and that means it can increase the risk of cancer. That is true, it is labelled as a class 2 carcinogen but it has only ever been shown to increase the risk of cancer in mice when they consume a ridiculous amount of it. There is absolutely zero evidence to show that aspartame in the amount we consume it would cause us any increase in risks of cancer whatsoever and if it did cause an increase you would literally need to be drinking something like 200 cans of pepsi max a day to even increase a slight risk that doesn't happen you know other things that are classed as a class 2 carcinogen mobile phone what i'm recording this podcast on now so if you guys use a mobile phone yep yeah, that's a class 2 carcinogen so's being a hairdresser so's aloe vera Right, so please just don't believe everything you read and hear because a lot of it is nonsense. Fizzy drinks for me have been a great support tool. They take away sweet cravings, especially late at night. So if anyone follows me on social media, I do a lot of evening lives. Monday, Tuesday and Thursday, uh, I always do a TikTok live at night time and I'm generally always drinking a can of Fizzy Orange or a Pepsi Max or a Coke Zero. Why? Because that is a time when I tend to crave something sweet and that knocks down my cravings. If I'm not going to have a can late at night, I always have a can with my tea. So I tend to drink one, maybe two cans of Fizzy Pop a day. Uh, again, no health issues whatsoever because I'm not drinking that much. Again, it's all about portion control. Every single thing we consume is a poison at a certain level. But that includes things like water. Um, but um, yeah, if you feel you are controlling your calories or your portion sizes are quite small when you eat your evening meal, have a can of fizzy pot with it. It's what I used to do, again, 10 years ago at the start of my journey because I'm being more responsible with food. I'm trying to get my stomach to shrink uh, and I've got a lot less on my plate than I would do normally. And having that fizzy pop, and where I came up with that was from going to like all-you-can-eat Chinese buffets. You go to an all-you-can-eat Chinese buffet or the all-you-can-eat Pizza Hut buffet, they supply you with free, unlimited, refill fizzy drinks. Why? Because it fills you up, it blokes you out, and therefore you are going to eat less food. Well, you're not pulling the wool over a 37-stone 
uh, man's eyes. When I went to an All You Can Eat Chinese buffet, they were always rather nervous because when they'd say, would you like a free refillable fizzy drink? I'm like, no, I'll just have water, please. It was the only time I ever drank water as a 37 stone man so I could get more food in. So yeah, have a kind of fizzy drink with your evening meals. Uh, I started doing regular exercise, something I'd never, ever done in the past. Never had a clue. No, never had a clue. Uh, never, never did any exercise uh, whatsoever. Never had a single clue what a gym looked like on the inside. Not a clue. And I did have an unhealthy relationship with exercise at the beginning of my journey. And up until me being a personal trainer, really, my attitude or relationship with exercise massively improved after my first uh, skin removal operation in 2016. I'll do another podcast on that. Uh, but yeah, I started doing regular exercise. Why I thought I was doing regular exercise at the start of my journey was purely for weight loss. And now why I do regular exercise is because it's just amazing for your physical and mental health. And if your physical and mental health is tip top, it makes the journey so much more easy. As I was talking before about water being a support tool, that's what exercise is. If my physical health is good, I find day-to-day -day tasks and chores and life easy. I find taking the dogs for a walk easy. I find going shopping easy. I find doing lots of jobs around the house easy. Why? Because I'm physically fit. Likewise, if my mental health is really good, that really helps with things like emotional eating. If I'm constantly stressed or angry or fearful or lonely or or, you know, I've got anxiety, depression, whatever else, that is going to trigger a lot of emotional eating, which will trigger a lot of, uh, of overeating. If my mental health's good, right, you know, I handle stress easy, I handle anger, fine, you know. Of course I get angry from time to time, people do, it's natural. I get stressed from time to time, it's natural, people do, but I handle it perfectly well. Why? And, and one of the main reasons, you know, there's other factors, but I, one of the main reasons is exercise. And if I go a period of time without doing regular exercise, and it's very rare, but if I go on holiday or something like that, I don't go to the gym or like over Christmas, um, Christmas just gone, I didn't exercise for 12 days or did any specific exercise and I could feel it messing with my mental health. So uh, doing regular exercise. About two months into my weight loss journey, I joined the gym. I started going twice a week on a regular basis. That increased to three times a week, four times a week, five times a week, up to the point where I became a personal trainer. And I was probably training six times a week. Did I do a bit too much? Yes. Now I set myself the target of going three times a week to the gym. I normally go five. And again, I'm not going to do, I'm not doing that for weight loss. I'm doing it because it's ace for my physical and mental health. And I love doing it. And the gym's a very social thing for me as well. I've got a lot of friends there and people I know. So I just enjoy going anyway. Uh, plus I do exercise that I love doing. But um, now I set myself, as long as I go three times a week, I am more than happy. Any more than that is just a bonus. But doing regular exercise, although at the beginning of my journey, I thought it was the main reason I was losing weight. Now I know it wasn't. At the beginning of my journey, just like it is now, it was just improving my physical and mental health, which allowed me to walk after three or four months, still being over 30 stone, but being able to walk for 20 odd minutes without stopping. You know, it also allowed me to control my eating a lot more because it really helps with uh, my, my mental health. You know, I came off my antidepressants just before I started. I've been on and off sertraline for me 19 years of age, up to starting my weight loss journey. Um, was tested. My dad was bipolar type 2. I was tested for it loads. They never could come to any conclusions whether I was bipolar. I could be very manic depressive at times. Uh, and I really struggled with my mental health. And, you know, I've thought about taking my own life a lot. I've tried to take my own life twice in my lifetime. I will be totally honest with you on that one. And again, that might be for another podcast down the line. And the last time I tried to take my own life was five weeks before starting my weight loss journey. Um, and, you know, it's... But since doing regular exercise, since starting this journey, yeah, you get the odd low mood. That's just natural. Uh, but it never lasts for more than maybe a day or two. Um, and, and, you know, it's, I have to put down things that I've implemented into my lifestyle that has stopped me feeling like that. And again, one of those things is doing regular exercise. And 
like I say, two months into my weightless journey, I was going twice a week. 10 years later, I'm now going between three and five times a week on a consistent basis. Uh, next, weight loss breaks is what I call them now. But at the start of my weight loss journey, again, I didn't want, it, it was this, you know, having one eye on being um, overly restricted. And I didn't want that. Right? I never wanted to feel overly restricted. So I kind of took the pressure on myself, off myself and I sort of said to myself, you know, if I've got a friend's, you know, if I've got a party on a Saturday night, it's a friend's birthday or a celebration or there's a big event going on in the pub, I am going to enjoy it. Most times I'm just going to go to the pub on a Friday night, four pints, bag of pork scratchings, that was it. But if there was a special occasion going on, rather than dodging it, just go and enjoy it. It's just one special occasion. And if you look over the course of a year, how many times do you actually have these? You know, you might have one a month. You might have one every day. It depends how social you are. I don't have that many. You know, I'm looking ahead now to 2024. And we've got two weddings this year and a couple of other bits and pieces. And that's it, right? So I always enjoyed them. Likewise, when I had a holiday, um, I had my first holiday at the end of June 2024, four or five months into my weight loss journey. And I, I, I can't lie, I did lose some sleep over it because I was, you know, what am I going to do on holiday? Do I just drink Diet Coke? So I just have two pints, then go on to a Diet Coke. I was going to see one of my best friends who lives in, uh, in, in the Alps in France. And do you know what? I just made the decision, no, Neil, you're going for four nights. It might have been three nights, three or four nights. Can't remember exactly what. I think it was four nights. Just go and enjoy yourself for four nights. The important thing is you get straight back doing what you're doing when you get home. And that's what I did. And I've done that on every holiday. I've done that after every Christmas since I started February 2014. And, you know, the first 10 months of my weight loss journey, I didn't weigh myself. And when I first weighed myself, it was the end of October and I went to the doctors. The doctors couldn't weigh me because I was too heavy. Their key, uh, scales went up to 200 kilograms and I weighed 234 when I started. So I just didn't weigh myself. I knew I was losing weight because my clothes were getting smaller and uh, yeah, people commenting and stuff like that. And then in October 2024, I went for a bit of a review. It might have been a review about my antidepressants that I was on. You know, I'd not been on them nine months and the doctors wanted to see me. I might have gone for a bit of a health check. I was very, I became a bit of a hypochondriac with my health first couple of years of my weight loss journey. I was always going, am I healthy? Am I all right? Can I have a blood test? Can you check me for this? Can you check me? And they were like, Neil, you're fine. Uh, anyway, I went in and said, come on, let's jump jump me on the scales. I was like, no, I don't want to. Why? Because if I'm not under 200 kilos, it might affect me and this and that. Oh, come on, get on the scales. So I did. I got on the scales uh, and I was 100 and... Anyway, I'd lost 100 pounds. I'd lost 100 pounds in the first uh, nine, 10 months. Uh, and that taught me, you know, I remember after weighing and seeing that loss, I went back to my car. I cried. I cried for about a minute. I can remember. And it, it was tears of joy. It wasn't an unhappy. It wasn't, I wasn't crying because I was unhappy. And I just sat there and I just contemplated everything and surmised everything. Surmised, again, is that the right word? I just sort of um, thought about, reflected, it's probably a better word, reflected on the last 10 months. And I was like, do you know what? I've had a chippy nearly every Wednesday night. I've been to the pub nearly every Friday night. I've had a Chinese nearly every Sunday night. I've been on two holidays, four nights in France, nine nights in Benidorm in that time. I'd enjoyed this person's birthday, that person's birthday, and I've still lost a hundred pounds. And that really cemented the fact that I did not need to over restrict myself to A, have successful weight loss, and B, actually not over restricting myself probably led me, because I've never ever stuck to a weight loss journey for nine, 10 months. Never, never in my life have I been that consistent. And I was just like, well, you know, this is the way to go. And it's still what I do now when it's when it's a holiday. I go on holiday, I enjoy it. When it's Christmas, I, I, I enjoy it. I have a cut off. So this is when I'm going to stop worrying about weight loss. This is when I'm going to get back at it. I stick to it. And in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't affect the journey. In fact, it prolongs it. It prolongs it. Uh, I've got two more. Then I'm wrapping it up. This is probably the longest podcast I've done. Uh, second to last one. By the way, there's no priority order in these. It's just something that I'm, I'm talking through. Prioritizing sleep. I used to have the worst sleep pattern in the world when I was 37 stone before I started my weight loss journey. I'll tell you why. I never wanted to go to sleep because as soon as I go, as soon as you go to sleep, tomorrow comes. And I never wanted tomorrow to come. That might sound really sad, but that's how I felt. I hated my life. I was existing. I wasn't living. 
and I just didn't want to face the next day. So the later I stayed up, um, the further the next day would become. So I used to go to sleep at two, three in the morning, get up at 11 o'clock in the morning. I was quite lucky. The job I did um, at the time, I didn't start till till dinner time-ish or just after dinner time. I was in sales and the sales, it sort of worked from like 12, one o'clock till seven o'clock in the evening. So I was able to have that sort of sleep pattern, but I hated it. I absolutely hated it because, you know, when my friends are up in the morning and you wake up in the morning and you've got a mobile phone and people have called you, text you, and you just feel like you're missing out. And I just didn't feel like I was normal. You know, people going to work at 7, 8 a.m. in the morning and, and it, you know, and even colleagues that I spoke to at work, even though we didn't start till dinner time, they'd be like, you know, what have you done this morning? Oh, well, I got up, took my kids to school, went to the gym, done this, done that, done the other. And I'm just sat there feeling rubbish about myself because I've been up about half an hour. So when I started my weightless journey, I wanted to get into a much better sleep pattern. And prioritizing sleep is fantastic. Again, feeling overtired, having poor sleep patterns massively affects mental health. And that can then trigger things like emotional eating uh, and stuff like that. Because being tired or overly tired is not a good emotion to have in the body. Um, so I started prioritizing sleep. And the first priority of mine was you need to go to sleep one day and wake up the next day. And basically that mean, meant trying to get to sleep before midnight. Turn your light out. When I started going to the gym, I used to go at half five in the morning because I was very self-conscious because of my size. So I used to go when it was dead. And at half five in the morning, it was dead. There was no one in there. So when I started going to the gym, and I only went a couple of times a week, but that day, that first day I got up at R5, went and exercised, and I went for a daily walk as well. I was so tired at night time. I just fell asleep at nine o'clock. And I remember waking up at five, six in the morning, and I was awake because I didn't have any more sleep by prioritizing sleep or sleep patterns, because normally I'd be going to sleep at two, three in the morning and getting up at 10, 11 o'clock in the morning. But, so I was going to sleep at nine o'clock and waking up at five. I've still had eight hours sleep, but I was getting up earlier. And sometimes if I woke up naturally at half five in the morning, I go and do an extra gym session because I'm awake, might as well. And I just got into a much better routine. And I'm the same now. I'm exactly the same now. I do not like falling asleep and waking up on the same day. So I will generally, lights out, half to 10, 11 o'clock. I don't need to be up stupidly early anymore. Different when I was a personal trainer. I was up at sort of half five again in the morning because uh, I had to be in work for half six doing sessions, um, and I would just naturally be flat out at half nine, ten o'clock at night. I don't really have that anymore because I'm retired as a personal trainer, but I still, you know, lights out. I'm always up at 7 a.m. in the morning, so I like lights out half 10, 11 o'clock, fast asleep, get, get sleep, good night's sleep, get up in the morning, make the most of your day. So I used to prioritize sleep at the start of my journey and I still do it now. And the last one is that high protein diet. Something I push all the time. Again, just like water, eating a lot of protein doesn't cause weight loss. The main benefit while on a weight loss journey is it is satiating. It fills you up. So if you put a lot of protein into your system, it's going to really help you control your calories. Other advantages of a high protein diet. It can increase your metabolism because of the thermic effect of food. It's quite hard for the body to digest, means it takes more energy to digest it. It also really helps to regulate blood sugars as well. Um, so if you eat anything that might spike blood sugars, if you eat a good source of protein with that, it will really help to, to level out your blood sugars. Uh, it'll stop them spiking too high and stop them crashing as well. But the main benefit, like I say, is it's satiating. Now, when I started my weight loss journey, you know, I'll hold my hands up. I had no idea what I was doing. I knew nothing about nutrition. I didn't really know much about calorie deficit. I just knew I was going to eat 2,500 calories, which would be less than I was burning. Um, and I did, for the first nine months, do a no-carb diet. Did I? Did I really? Let me rephrase that. I thought I was doing a no-carb diet. I didn't have a clue. I didn't really know what carbs were. I, knew, I, thought, I just thought carbs was bread and pasta. So that's kind of what I cut out. Right, and I also cut a lot of like cake out and crisps because I knew that was carbohydrates. I thought rice and oats were grains. I didn't realize they were carbs as well. I didn't realize fruit and veg was carbs. I just call it fruit and veg. And we'd still put fruit and veg in a separate category now. Um, but still, yeah, it was carbohydrates. So 
when I was, and I, I cringe a little bit now because I was probably taught to a lot of people that knew what they were talking about because everyone asked me about whale oil. Oh, how are you doing it? You stuck to it for six months, eight months. Like, well, yeah, kind of, I don't really, I don't eat carbs anymore. All right, do you know, what do you eat in a day? Well, I have porridge for my breakfast. I'm sure so, some people or so many people have been like, it's porridge, not carbs because it's oats. But for me, I just saw it as grains. Uh, again, I used to have egg fried rice on a, on a, on a Sunday night when I had my Chinese, I used to have mushy peas with my with, uh, with my um, lightly battered fish on a on a Wednesday night, which again great source of carbohydrates, loads of fiber in mushy peas, absolutely love them. Um, so I did eat carbs. I just cut out a lot of rubbish carbs, basically. Uh, and if you cut out a lot of rubbish carbs, you are going to need to replace those calories. And I replaced those calories with protein. Again, at the time, I didn't realize protein was the most satiating macronutrient. I didn't realize the benefits of it. But I just knew that when I had a four egg omelet or I had a load of chicken, I just didn't feel that hungry. You know, when I had a protein shake mid-afternoon and a protein shake in the evening, it just absolutely curbed any, you know, cravings or any hunger issues. So, high protein diet so at the start of my weight loss journey i'd quite often for breakfast have omelets um i'd either have omelets or i'd have porridge or sometimes i'd have um just um three sort of like soft boiled eggs and and a bowl of porridge i and i don't know why it was just something i quite enjoyed eating i didn't have the eggs in the porridge by the way i'd i'd, I'd have porridge with a bit of honey on and then have three eggs afterwards because I'm not eating, I wasn't eating bread at the time. So I just have three sort of semi soft boiled eggs. I loved it. Um, but that high protein diet did it from the start. Again, when as soon as I started going to the gym, I wanted to be a bit of a gym boy. So I started having protein shakes. And again, I thought at the time you just have protein shakes because you go to the gym um, and I want to build muscle and get a bit hench and this, that, and the other. Really, now I know that the protein shakes, yes, of course, a high-protein diet helps build muscle. Of course it does. But looking back now, I wasn't really training that great. But by adding the protein shaking, because I've been to the gym, it filled me up. It was satiating, and that helped control my calories. So from the start of my weight loss journey, I ate way more protein than I ever had done, and that is exactly the same today. Uh, I prioritize protein. I don't track protein macros. I'm not really too concerned about how uh, sticking to an exact number every day. I just make sure that 95% of the time when I have a meal or a snack, it has a source of protein. And if I'm going to eat something that doesn't have a source of protein, I tend to have a protein shake just before or just after it. Or sometimes I'll have if I fancy a bowl of cereal, there's nothing wrong with having a bowl of cereal. Sometimes I'll use protein shake as the milk instead of milk just to give that extra hit of protein. And there you go. Those are the lifestyle changes. And why I call them lifestyle changes because all those things I implemented into my lifestyle from within three months of starting my weight loss journey in 2014. And every one of those things is present on my journey now or in my lifestyle now. And in 2014, 2015, 2016, they supported me losing my weight. Because I've kept them in my lifestyle now, they now support me either maintaining my losses or if I decide to lose a bit more weight, then they kick in again and support with that weight loss. If you're going to go on a weight loss method and that weight loss method is only going to change your lifestyle for a short period of time, remember, long-term problem requires a long-term solution. So if you're only going to stick to not eating carbs for three months, that isn't going to solve your weight issue. If you're only going to do intermittent fasting for six months, it's not going to solve your weight issue. If you're only going to go to Slimming World for three months and then drop out, it isn't going to solve your weight issue. Whatever you are doing today to change what you've done in the past to lose weight and then hopefully maintain it once you hit your goal, it needs to be things that are going to be ever present. And the things I've talked about now are ever present in my lifestyle and in all honesty, if you put the effort in, they should be ever present in your lifestyle. That's it. That is it. I think that's definitely the longest podcast I've ever done. Uh, you might need to listen to it in two sections or you might have listened to it in two sections. But anyway, 
Uh, hope you've enjoyed it. Hope you found it helpful. Uh, as always, whatever platform you're watching this on, please can have a like, a follow, uh, that would a subscribe. That'd be amazing. Any questions, any comments, any thoughts, please get them into the comments and the boxes. And as always, if you feel you need any extra help with your, uh, your weight loss journey, if you are struggling, you can come and join my community. It is just five pounds for your first month using code welcome. If you feel you need more support than just being a member of my community, you can have me as your one-to-one -one weight loss coach and together we can implement those lifestyle changes. Uh, again, I'll put links to my website in the description. Um, and until next time, you know the drill by now, we are going to boss our weight loss. <laughs>